Genesis, Exodus, chapter 6. We'll start in verse 28. Exodus 6, verse 28. And it came to pass on the day when the Lord spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak thou unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. And Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? 7 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of the land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt, and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt, and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord had commanded them. Turn over to 8 and verse 15. Chapter 8 and verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Verse 19. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Verse 32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at that time also, neither would he let the people go. 9 and verse 12. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. 10 and verse 20. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself. See my face no more, for in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, Thou hast spoken well, I will see thy face again no more. And here we see as this story unfolds of Exodus, in between all of the gaps, I left out the, the great plagues that God put upon the people of, of uh, Egypt, even as he had promised to do in chapter 7 and verse 3. Even as Moses and Aaron, it shows in, in chapter 7 and verse 13, that they caused that the Lord, or they caused that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. In 7 and verse 13, it says, And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said, pointing back to the promise that God had made. And the Lord took notice in verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. And it plays out in chapter 8, where Pharaoh further hardens himself against the commands of God. And in chapter 9, finally, the Lord hardeneth Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh got exactly what 
he had asked for. A stony heart that had constantly and consistently rejected the man of God and finally rejected the word of the Lord and finally hardened against of his own will. God, God says, fine, take it. You can have a stony and hard heart and the Lord enables for that to be done unto him. John chapter 12 from the New Testament describes this same type of action. John chapter 12 and in verse 35. John 12 verse 35. John 12, verse 35 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. John 12, and verse 36, While ye have light, believe in that light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But... Though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah, we can also reflect back and remember the saying that played out in Exodus, that that would be fulfilled. It says that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah hath said, because Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Isaiah here witnessing the glory of God, and before God taking upon a commission to himself to go unto the people that would not hear the message that would not hear the voice of God in their life, and rather would reject it, and the fulfillment of God's purpose played out, even as it did in Egypt, that their eyes were blinded, that their heart was hardened. And because they had rejected and rejected and rejected the message so many times, it got to the point where they could not believe. They could not be converted. They could not be healed by the word of God. They could not be saved. And there are some standing among us today that are in the same state. They have heard the trumpet call in their life time and time and time again. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. And, and, and despite the many scriptures that explain this very clearly, people still say, well, it's never too late. There's always a chance. No sin is too deep that the Lord could not reach down and pull someone out of it. And I partly believe that, but the problem was highlighted in verse or chapter 12 when it said they could not believe. I believe the statement when it says, whosoever believeth on the Son hath life. And to have life, they would need to believe on the name of the Son of God. But these referred to in John chapter 12 could not believe. Why? Because God had hardened their hearts. In the problem that I find so often is people really find a hard time believing what is referred to as the reprobate doctrine from the standpoint of the homosexuals. Because everyone's got a queer uncle. Everyone's got a homo niece. Everyone's got somebody in their family that they empathize with. And so, therefore, they often reject it out of heart of what they call compassion for the lost. But even when you bring this up unto independent Baptists, they need to understand, and they should understand, that there are many examples of how this can come to be. Revelation chapter 14 talks about somebody to whom has crossed a line where they cannot be saved. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. These took upon themselves a mark and a number and a name that they could buy and sell within the commerce of the one world government 
So they are breathing, of course. Why? Because they wanted to buy and sell. They were alive today. But the Bible describes that in this day, though they are still walking, though they are still talking, though they are still breathing, though they are still very much alive in the flesh, that their end is set. They shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. They shall be tormented with that fire and with that brimstone forever and ever. And that is the same that is in the presence of God himself as he witnesses the burning, as he enables the burning, as he causes for the burning to take place. Why? Because his judgment is just. And so it says, if any man, the same shall drink of the wrath of God, the same shall be tormented forever and ever. Those live that have taken the mark of the beast, we would call them reprobate. There is no hope of salvation for them. They have crossed the line whereby they bowed down to the image of the beast, worshiped the image of the beast, took a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and sealed their fate. They will die. They will go to hell in a time in the future. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, another example. See, these examples that I'm bringing up, most people will believe. They understand them. They, they say, yep, absolutely, I believe that. So then why are we teaching that it's never too late for people? Why are we teaching that people can always repent and believe on the name of the Son of God upon their deathbed? Why are we teaching that there is not this line that somebody crosses whereby God would not save them? Why are we saying that they can't go too far from God? Why are we teaching this? We have the mark of the beast. Another one, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31, the Bible says, Wherefore I say unto you all manner of sin and blasphemy. Does that say some sin? No, that says all. So we see this, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. If we were to just leave it there, we could say, see, that's what most of these independent Baptists, that's what most of the Christian world believe. And they teach, they say, so all manner of sin shall be forgiven you. God can sin, forgive you of anything. But if we were to keep Keep reading, which is always wise to do, grab the context of the scriptures, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, so here's someone speaking against Jesus Christ himself, it says it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world neither in the world to come, right? So here we have the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit being the exception to the rule that all sins can be forgiven. Every sin that a man sinneth can be forgiven, but it says this, but the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven, neither in this world, while they're still alive and breathing, nor in the world to come when they're suffering everlasting fire and torments. There is no forgiveness for this sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And what is that? Well, look back in verse 24. It says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How can this kingdom stand? And if I, Jesus speaking, by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. What he's saying here is that they had attributed the works, the great miracles, the signs, the wonders that Jesus had done to being works of the devil. We saw that play out in the Old Testament. We saw in, in the time of the, of, of the Exodus when Moses had, the, or he had the, 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 the men that did great miracles and signs, the sorcerers that came to him, and when he cast down the, the rod and it became a snake. They cast down the rod and it became a snake. But it got to the point where the miracles were too great, and that's when the Egyptians, the soothsayers, the, the magicians, they said, this is but the finger of God, and Pharaoh still hardened his heart. But they were attributing all that time, and I believe perhaps this was even the sin of Pharaoh at the time, was that he looked at the works that were done and attributed them to Moses just being like one of the Egyptians, just being like one of the devils, just being like one of those soothsayers, doing miracles in the name of Beelzebub. And perhaps this was his great sin, where he blasphemed against the Holy Ghost, attributing the work of God to that of a devil. 
And this is another one that you will bring up to Christians. And they'll say, yeah, okay, not in this life nor in that to come. And it's very clear. Why would he talk about both contexts where there's no forgiveness now and there's no forgiveness in hell if there wasn't a window of time where forgiveness might be sought on this world? It only makes sense that this is describing somebody who has done the deed and lives out the rest of their days reprobate concerning the faith. One thing to notice is that it says in verse 30 there, it says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And we need to remind ourselves today, and we need to remind the other Christians around us, that there is a real fight, and it's time to get in or it's time to get out. If you're not in the fight, you are not just sitting on the sidelines, you are actually scattering abroad. If you're not with us, you're against us, that's what Christ is teaching. And when you read through the Bible, you find more and more and more occasions, Judas perhaps, perhaps just being one of them that comes to my mind, whereby there was a sin, there was a clear marking upon him where that by he could not be saved. The Bible describes Judas as being a devil from the beginning. That means from the very beginning, as the son of perdition, he was not saved and could not be saved. He was set for perdition. He was set for damnation. He was a devil from the beginning of the serve is that he had with Jesus Christ and that same picture we see played out in Pharaoh as he hardened his own heart at the hearing of the word of God and then eventually God just gave him that stony heart and turned him over to the reprobate mind. But what I'm pointing out here is that there was a time when little Judas was saved. There was a time when he was just your typical lost man that could have believed and yet he did not and he rejected it and there's so many people in our lives that they are on a pathway to what we would call the reprobate mind hearing the gospel hearing the word hearing the preaching and yet they refuse and yet they reject and yet they say nope 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 and that's why this verse comes to light when I read it in the context of what's happening the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost the negation of any hope of salvation it says he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad it's so important to get with with Christ that way you would gather with him because if you're not in the fight with Christ if you're not actively seeking the lost you are scattering abroad you are sending more people forth to perhaps one day commit that sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit perhaps one day take upon themselves a mark of the beast in their right hand or in the forehead perhaps one day they will just reject and reject and reject or perhaps you'll just be too shy to give it to them and you're the last voice that they would have heard and therefore you have scattered abroad let us yoke up with Christ let us get involved in the fight gathereth with him and therefore be with him so the third type that I'm going to talk about, this is the one that's often rejected, is just the darkened and reprobate mind. We see that the mark of the beast is a point whereby once you cross it, you are damned. You are not going to heaven. You are not getting saved, though you're still breathing today. We see that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. It's one of these things where if you commit the sin, you don't have forgiveness now or later. You will not be getting saved, though you are still alive and still breathing here today. And here's two examples. But the next one is that of the reprobate mind. Turn to Isaiah, if you would. Isaiah chapter 6. As you're turning to Isaiah chapter 6, let me read for you, quote for you, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 30. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 30 says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 30, we find a definition of the word reprobate, and that is rejected. Very clearly in that context, reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. We are calling them a spade because they're a spade. We are calling them reprobate because they are rejected. They're, they're the same thing. And this is how the King James Bible always defines itself. Right in the context, reprobate, rejected. They come together and you can understand what that word means. Isaiah chapter 6 is the other the other angle is the actual main quote that comes from John chapter 12. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible reads, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So after this great vision that was seen of the prophet Isaiah, the call of God comes out as he openly calls to an entire congregation seemingly, the whole world perhaps of people. And he says, who shall go for me? Who shall go for us? 
He says, here am I, send me. Isaiah accepting the call of God then. In verse 9 it says, and he said, now here God is going to give the commission to Isaiah. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there should be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Here God says, until the end of time, until all of the places are forsaken, until all the land is waste and without inhabitant, you take and you preach this same message. What are you going to tell them? You're going to tell them, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. And here the command is clear. Go and tell. Go and tell. And they here they are presenting a message that is heard, yes, but not understood. A message that is seen, yes, but without any kind of perception. Here the preacher, with the word of God in tow, comes and he makes fat hearts and he makes heavy ears and he makes eyes that are closed and dull of seeing and lest, the Bible says here, lest, so just in case, so to avoid the risk of, to the intent that we could prevent what? That they would see, that they would hear, that they would understand, and that they would be healed. Here God gives a message to Isaiah that is so rejected by the people that he set it forth with the purpose, not that the whole world would be saved, but that the whole of the world would be rejected at this time. That they would all hear, but not understand. That they would all see, but not perceive. And Isaiah was a great prophet unto the nations. He preached the word of God, and yet God sent it forth with the purpose that they wouldn't understand, they wouldn't hear. Why? Because they've been blinded. Their eyes have been shut. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their heart doesn't understand. They will not convert and they will not be healed. This preaching gave a clear separation. It divided people. We have the prophet of God preaching the word and we have all those that are rejecting it. They're being separated from. Verse 13 says this. It says, but yet in it shall be a tenth. And it shall return and be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. So here a tenth, the holy seed, the substance of what is reaped is pulled forth and brought out of this destruction, brought out of this fire. Here judgment is set, the word goes forth, and it divides the sheep from the goats. It takes those that heard not and puts them on one portion. That's nine-tenths of it. It takes those that have heard and are holy and of the holy seed, and it pulls them off to the side. Why? Because they have heard the truth. They have converted, and they have been healed. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And as you do, I want to charge each and every one of us that we have the same ministry today. What's that ministry? It's to go and to tell. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, our command stays the same. Whether they receive of your message or whether they reject it outright, the message remains the same. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, it shows us that the word goes out and does exactly what God had planned for it to do. Sometimes we know that the word will bring light and life. We've seen it. We've all experienced it. But sometimes the word does the complete opposite. It brings destruction and it brings death. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll go back in verse 12, it says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. And that's ultimately our goal, is to remove that veil. Why? Because we point them to Christ, and when they're in Christ, that veil comes away. Verse 15, But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn unto the Lord, the heart being spoken of here, the veil shall be taken away. And that's what we talked about a little bit over here in the first message. How they looked, they turned unto the Lord. They believed on Jesus Christ, right? And that veil, that wall of unbelief, 
faith was taken away. Verse 17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. Verse four, or chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. So even as we receive mercy, we receive what? This ministry. We receive this calling to go and to tell. And we're to do it with diligence. We're not to faint in it. And that's what it says there. It says, seeing we have received that ministry, we have received that mercy, we need to not faint in that. But, verse 2, have received or but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully so there's no trickery to this presentation like it said previous it says we use great plainness of speech not crafty not dishonest not handling the word of God deceitfully I experienced that today but by manifestation of the truth commanding ourselves to every man conscience in the sight of God. So here we are to present ourselves and our ministry by manifesting the truth. We don't go about and try to come up with some sort of crafty way of getting the gospel in the back door. We don't go and we try to talk and schmooze with people, get to know them and trick them into hearing the gospel. No, we manifest the truth. We commend ourselves to every man's conscience. In other words, they can read us and judge us. Why? Because we walk in the sight of God with the same ministry and the, and the manifestation of the truth. Verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And that's exactly what happens. If we're not to go in the truth, if we're not to take this ministry by it upon us as we have received mercy and as we have received the salvation of God and go forth with it, manifesting the truth abroad everywhere we go, then we are hiding the gospel and we're hiding it to the lost. And you can see how it starts to play out whereby if you're not working with Christ, you're scattering abroad. Because if you're not taking that ministry with you, you are not bringing it to the lost and there's just going to be more and more and more and more lost each and every day as they're born or as they, they come into that age of accountability. And if you're hiding the gospel, it's hit to those that need it most, to the lost. Verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And we saw that here, where the world, or we could even say Satan, has blinded the minds, has blinded the eyes as he interacts with the senses, interacts with the spirit, in order that they would not believe the gospel. So yes, God does some force set forth that ministry whereby he purposely blinds people. But all the while, Satan is working to purposely blind people. And the ones that Satan is blinding are the ones that we need to reach most. They're the ones that are most I don't want to say innocent, but the ones that are most ready, the ones that are most receptive, the ones that are most, um, uh, let's, let's say, holy, right? The newborn child that comes in. The first person that Satan's trying to defile is that young child, is that person that has not been tainted with the world, the one that would be ready to receive of the gospel. And now verse 5 says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And here it's highlighting the fact that the gospel that we preach, that we go in power, that we take the light that was out of darkness, our ministry is to give that light unto others. But the highlight here is that that treasure, though it's been imparted unto an earthen vessel to carry it forward, is all of God. The power is completely his. And while Satan goes and he tries to blind the minds of people, we go and we preach to try to bring the light unto those same people. The power is of God. And so whether they hear or whether they forbear, we go in the power of his spirit to do his work. And as Satan tries to blind, we come and we bring and we try to give light. And then the opportunity comes. Men just simply choose. And it's not up to us to decide whether they choose, yes, I'll believe on Christ, or whether they choose, no, thank you, I'll reject it. Our responsibility is to go and as much as in us is, present the word with clarity unto people. 
The reality, though, is, is that even as we preach, as it was for Isaiah and his ministry, when we bring the light of the truth of the scriptures unto people, sometimes it does not bring them to the light, but draws them unto darkness. Even as Isaiah has said, their eyes are blinded, right? Their heart is hardened. Their ears are dull of hearing. And as the message comes into them, they get more and more and more in that state. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> So here what we have is the situation whereby the soul is given the gospel, right? We are speaking to the soul to try to revive a dead spirit. Ultimately, we want the body to get in agreement with the soul. And so we bring the gospel unto that living soul. That's why we call it soul winning, right? Their mind, their will, their emotions. We need them to understand, comprehend, believe the gospel so that they can put their faith in Jesus and his cross. But this body is a world of hurt, it's, it's distraction, it's, it's what's grounding them, it's what's keeping them stuck here. Especially if there's a big pull of the world here, upon that body, upon that flesh, upon that carnal person, right? So we come, and while we're trying to talk to the soul, too often the body will be distracted by video games, or what it has to do that day, or what it, right? There's all sorts of things that can distract from this world and from the influence of this world. And so what usually happens here is that we will bring the gospel to the soul and in the ideal situation, they believe, they talk to the body, right? The soul con convinces with the body to call upon the Lord and both in one come and receive a living spirit and are united in that faith and in that belief, right? Because the Bible says the natural man, which is what you have here, right? This is all natural man. receiveth not the things of God for their spiritually concern, right? Neither indeed can he know them. So really, when we're talking to the natural man, the soul and the body, what we're trying to do is to get the word to agree. They would come over unbelief and that spirit would revive. The spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We need to bring that spirit to the light of the gospel of Christ by having the soul desire it, bring the body to call upon and to receive the gospel. And everything comes to life in one uh, you know, perfect picture of full salvation. But what happens with the reprobate mind is what happens with Pharaoh. Right here, he hears the word, he hardens his heart. Then, when that happens, he takes a step forward, right? He's here now. He's a little bit closer. He's a little bit more in unbelief. He's a little bit more influenced by the world. At that same time, you're going to see, God says, okay, fine takes a step a little bit further. He's still going to have the opportunity to have the gospel come and to, and to reach out and to believe by faith and to trust on Christ. He still has opportunity to overcome the world by believing on Christ, right? But the thing is, he's not in as good of a position to see the cross. He's, he's moved a little bit forward. The world is now blinding his mind a little bit more, right? He's a little bit more in tune with the flesh and the carnal side of his own self. Seeing over that wall of unbelief becomes a greater challenge. And then what happens is somebody will come to him again. The Bible will be preached to him. He'll hear the truth plainly again. And then what happens? No, no thanks. So he said no here. He says no here. And then he says no here. And here it's settled. Here he's fully on board with the world. Here he's completely absorbed his soul in desiring what the world wants over his head, what has lordship over him, and what his body desires most, what it feels the most. We had a gap here from there to there. And that was... The conscience. Here, he might have been convinced that he was a sinner. He might have been convinced that some of the things he did were wrong. He might have been convinced that, that he needed a savior. But when he says no, he's now here. His conscience is gradually getting smaller. His, 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 uh, his heart for knowing what is right and what is wrong is gradually closing. It's gradually getting darker. The Bible describes it as being seared. If anyone knows, anyone knows anything about being seared, it's like when you burn yourself, right? The first time you burn yourself, it hurts a lot. And then the next time, there's a little bit of a tougher skin to it. People that have worked maybe at Tim Hortons or something, worked around hot stuff. Like eventually you get a little bit better at handling things. Why? Because you've become calloused. We don't want a calloused conscience. We don't want a conscience that's seared with a hot iron because the more you say no and your conscience is seared about what's right or wrong, you take a step forward. You say no and your conscience is seared about what's right or wrong to the point where you get here and there's just no conscience. Right? You've, you've limited the natural resolve 
to do anything right. You're just completely bent to what the world wants, which is over saw by who, Satan, right? You're completely carnal. Your flesh is what guides your every will, your every emotion. And now from this standpoint, God says, fine. You don't want me? No. So be it. He's not going to see past the wall of unbelief. He's not going to see past the world over top of his head and the, the carnal mind that he has. There's no conscience that would link himself with God. Really, at this point, that spirit is dead and it's going to stay that way. That unbelief wall might as well just fall and crush him. It would be better for him. It would be better for all of us because we wouldn't have to live around this type of person who is completely absorbed in the world and what Satan wants for him, has no sight of God, right? Because the Bible records that if he, he, he hath hardened their heart. He gave them exactly what they want. They said, no, he said, fine. They said, no, he said, fine, until the point where they couldn't even see past the wall of unbelief that was before them. And this is the state that you find in Romans chapter 1. We all know this, but let's go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 11. Romans 1 and verse 18, rather. The Bible says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So the truth, then, is that conscience, right? We all have that natural bearing within us of what is right and what is wrong. We hold the truth. The Bible says here of these, they hold it in unrighteousness. And the wrath of God is indeed revealed against it. Verse 19, and I love how it says this. It says the wrath is revealed. They hold the truth. So this group does not have a dullness in their understanding of the truth. It has been revealed to them, the truth, and yet they hold it in unrighteousness. Verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Here we see the knowledge of God, knowing God, understanding God, is made plain unto them. God hath showed it unto them, made it clear unto them. So here we see that they are without excuse as far as the understanding of who God is. Verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him, who God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Clearly seen then, understood. What is? His power. What is? His self, his Godhead, who God is, right? And his all present, all powerful self is clearly seen. And it says here, they are without excuse. Why? Because it has been revealed unto them. Why? Because they hold that truth and yet they hold it in unrighteousness. Verse 21, because that, when they knew God, so they knew God here, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was Darken. Here you still have that the people recognize, be, understand, and, and, and comprehend who God is. They understand his wrath. They understand his power. And when they knew him, they glorified him not as God. In other words, they said, I want nothing to do with it. I know who you are. I hate it. I don't like it. I want nothing to do with it. Neither were they thankful. And that's the greatest thing you can do when you know God is to just be thankful for him, what he's given you, what he provides for you, the very breath in your lungs. And yet these glorified him not even as God. They recognize and they understand and they know and they comprehend his eternal power, his Godhead, and they say, no, I will not glorify him as his position is due. I will not be thankful for who he is, but rather they become vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart now here is darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So the professing of your own self to be wise, that's pride. That, that's just me being, I am so wise, I am so smart, I know everything of God, and yet I'm not going to glorify it as if it was him or his being or his doing. I won't be thankful for that. And the Bible says that pride goeth before destruction. Therefore, that professing of wisdom goeth before you become fools. The fool hath said in his heart, 
there is no God. That's exactly what they do when they say, I want nothing to do with this God that I know. Verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And so they took what they knew about God and basically just inverted it, made it completely man-centered about the creation more than about the creator. They made God in their own image and chose to follow him their own way. Verse 24, it begins. At this point, they've always done their own will. They've decided the path that they're on. They've recognized, they've understood who God is and his eternal power and what God is and how he has become or how he is what he is, right? They, they just comprehend the fullness of God and yet they reject it. The Bible says they are without excuse. They profess themselves to be wise. They became Fools as if they believe God not at all, right? They do want nothing to do with him, pushing him away. And the Bible says, wherefore God also gave them up to what? Uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They said, I want nothing to do with God. Therefore, God gave them up unto what? Their lusts unto their lies, unto their own dishonor between themselves, unto their own corrupt mentality and their own mind. God just gave them to that uncleanness of their own hearts, allowing for their own heart to be the guide of what? Their flesh, the guide of what? Whatever the world says is right. Verse 26, again, it says, For this cause, now we'll go back to 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We already touched upon that. How they took the truth that they understood, professed themselves to be wise in it, and rather were turned into fools where they're going to worship what God made. And they know God made it more than God himself. Not giving him the due thanks. Not giving him the, new cre the due credit. Not glorifying him in that. Verse 26 says, for this cause, again, God gave them up unto vile affection. So we can even watch this play out, right? They say, no, okay, God's going to give them up to uncleanness, to follow after their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. That's just your average worldly carnal person who's just, who's just bent to do whatever gratifies their flesh, right? And then it says this, for this cause, God gave them up to what? Vile affections. Now here's where they transition from the things that some normal, natural individual would do unto the vile affections. Uncleanness is something that has a sacrifice for in the Old Testament. Um, vile affections does not. And so they've crossed that line whereby they're not going to see God over their unbelief. They're not going to see God past the flesh that is leading them and past the carnalness of their mind. God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense for their error which was meet. And let's not try to be too harsh with God here. Verse 27 makes it clear. Even as they did not want to retain, retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to it. That's what verse 28 says. And even as they did not like to retain God their knowledge, right? They pushed him away. God gave them over to exactly what they had asked for. To do those things which are not convenient. He answered their prayer in the affirmative. We need to be cautious in our own lives not to pray for certain things and expect them to go a certain way and then have God answer your prayer in the affirmative. That's what these people did to the end of their very soul. God gave them over to the reprobate mind. And what did that do? Well, at one point, they were just doing natural, worldly things, full of lust, full of lies, but they passed over as God gave them up unto vile affections. They did what was against nature rather than what was natural. The men here burning in their lust one toward another, the women changing the natural use into that which was against nature, and then God gives them over to the reprobate mind, even as they had asked for it. Now here, verse 29, being filled. Now it doesn't say they do these things. It doesn't say they, they commit such things. It doesn't say anything to that effect. It says being filled with all. And all always means all, right? It's, it's all encompassing. This list is what they are full of. So we know full means there's no room for anything else. We know all means it encompasses what's about to be talked of. And it says unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, 
boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without natural, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So here the Bible describes what happens once God gives them up, God gives them up, and God gives them over to the reprobate mind. This is the same reprobate mind that we would see in the person that takes the mark of the beast. This is the same reprobate mind that would be seen in the person that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost. Why? Because God removed himself from them and gave them over to that very mind. They are damned from this point on, and they are full of all the traits that we see listed below. Quite often people will say, well, you know, you've been disobedient unto your parents, therefore you were born with a reprobate mind. That's a lie, because the Bible is clear of the progression that happens here, where people reject and they become full of just the general lusts of any man, and they are consumed by it, to eventually God reaching out again, and they become given over to the vile affections. The progression just keeps playing out to which the point... And and the finality of it all is that they're given over to the reprobate mind and they're full of these things. People at this time will say, well, you're preaching that they are worthy of death. And I agree, they are worthy of, of death. But keep reading into Romans chapter 2. Well, of course, we should keep reading into the context. It says right before that, that they are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So they'll say, oh, well, if you have pleasure in anything that the reprobate does, then you're caught up in this. Verse 1 says, Therefore thou art an excusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for in thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? And, and it continues on and on and on. And I love continuing on to read that because you know what the Apostle Paul is doing here? He is setting forth for an example the suffering, the vengeance of eternal fire, even as described in the book of Jude, that these that have taken the natural course of the wickedness of men have found themselves to where their soul has rejected God and moved a little bit closer to reprobation, whereby they are filled with lust and lies and the most carnal wicked things that man can do. Then they have taken that next step and they have received in themselves the air which is meat and they are now full of these things. And the Apostle Paul brings this into into the context because he just said, hey, here's where you could end up even where you're breathing today. You could end up being filled with these things. You could end up given up by God, given over by God, where God won't even look at you. He can't even see you for the unbelief wall that's before your face. He has turned his back on you just the way you have turned your back on him. You rejected him. He rejected you. And therefore, you are in this case. Now, unbeliever, let's talk gospel. Now, unbeliever, look at what your end is if you reject today. Look at what your end would be if you reject tomorrow. Who knows how many chances you would even have left you need to believe today. Because tomorrow could be the day that God gives you up. Tomorrow could be the day that God gives you over. Right now could be the time, the moment that God gives you over to a reprobate mind where you're filled with all these things. And where you might as well have just taken the mark of the beast. You might as well have just received... Uh, the mark that damns you to hell. You might have just blasphemed against the God that's desiring to know and save your soul. You might have just said no for the last time. So here, you're an excusable old man. You're judging this list. You're judging the wicked. Hey, I can grab hold of just one of these things without understanding of the God that loves you and point you to the fact that you're on the pathway to reprobation. You're on the pathway to hell and you can face the very judgment of God where you're standing today and breathing. We are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth of them which commit such things. Thinkest thou this old man that judges them which do such things and do us the same things? You've lied. You've been a liar, right? Do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? Do you think you're going to spend another day saying no to him and not be closer to the final judgment, the final breath? Who knows, he might even let you go into your own wickedness and vile perversion before you even breathe the last breath. You need to get this right today. You need to get saved today. And this is exactly what Romans 1 was built for. It was to give the worst case scenario of a filthy 
pervert, sodomite, homo, and say, you don't want to be like this, and the only way you're going to avoid it, because tomorrow could be your last day where you're given over to what? Unrighteousness. Given over to what? Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, haters of God. All of these things become and consume who you are as a reprobate person. That could be tomorrow. Get it right today. Get saved. And then he goes from Romans 2 to Romans 3. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? And he continues on to Romans chapter 4, being justified freely by his faith. He continues on and he tries to plead with the people, the people in the book of Romans, that they need to believe on the name of the Son of God. They need to call upon him and receive him by faith. Because God commended his love towards you and that while you were sinners, Christ died for you. Reprobate, it's too late. He's given you over. There is no chance. There is no hope. So get it right today. And so this, again, is the call. We've received mercy. Go and with great plainness preach it to the lost. Because tomorrow could be the day that they turned over to a reprobate mind. This is why the Bible says that those that are not gathering with me are scattering abroad. Because the more of these that we have, the closer we are to that beast system. Where I mean, just shutting down our PayPal is the least of our concerns. Does anyone remember Genesis 19? They're beating down a certain door to find a couple certain holy angels. They're smitten with blindness, and they persist. Implacable, unmerciful. Send us those holy angels, right? So we need to reach them when they're here. Because when they're here, haters of God, enemies of the cross of Christ, right? Deceivers, lying, being deceived, false prophets. There's just more and more and more and more and more of them. And what if... That person that you avoided speaking to on the subway. That person you avoided speaking to at the workplace. What if this was their last chance to hear the voice of God that was from you? And tomorrow they're here. You're scattering abroad if you don't get involved in the gospel ministry. And this is something I need to encourage myself in each and every day. Because I, I come into contact with unsaved people all the time. We need to remember that we're in part of the spiritual battle. And people are maybe two breaths away from having no hope of salvation. We need to be that light shining into their lives. Hey, sometimes we'll preach it, and it'll harden them. And it'll just, they'll become that reprobate just because they rejected the preaching of the gospel. But that's not our business. Our business is, remember how we talked about, there was no unbelief here when we were saved, we were looking at the cross of Christ. Our business is to lift him up, and we would live the life he wants us to and reach those that are still over here. In order to bring truth to them and see them saved to the end that God's kingdom would come upon this earth because we have done our part. Christ will be glorified.